All right, Alexander, let's answer the questions from our live stream with Robert Barnes. And we have from Commando Crossfire, one of two, come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving and you better start swimming or, or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are changing. Wow. Well said. That was wonderfully well uh, said. I, 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 I've heard this poem, but I can't remember who is the. I think writer. it's a song. The oh, it's a so, I know, I know it's a song. Yeah. I, I think. Is yeah. it? Is it? Yeah. Is it? Is it? Is it Dylan? No, no. Yeah. Wait a minute. What am yeah. I saying? Yeah, I think it's, it's yeah, Dylan. Think yeah, it is. it's Dylan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Commander Crossfire. <laughs> there you Come go. Let us know in the comments. Yeah. Let us know in the comments. Commander the Crossfire. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Chris uh, Primer says it feels righteous to send the super chat. Thank you, Chris uh, Melody. Thank you for that super. Sticker John says, you're late. We are here, John. Thank you for that super chat. Tim Gibson says, it's a shame that while Biden is fighting Russia, all neocon Republicans can think about is Trump. Yeah, so true. <laughs> Absolutely correct. Uh, um, it, it does show you, on the one hand, what an enormous difference Trump has made in American politics. I mean, you mustn't underestimate his importance. And it also shows you, I'm afraid, how the establishment is really a two-headed monster. <laughs> they may, the, the, the establishment may have two heads, but it is one monster. Yep. Uh, Galen Van Brook, thank you for that super chat. Jerry, thank you for that super chat. Eric, thank you for that super sticker. Ivan says, appreciate your work, gents. Thank you, Ivan. Mark Hill says, insanity. Elaine Paulino, thank you for that super sticker. Rogue Thought says, I've read many books that featured a dystopian future. I never thought I'd live in a time when dystopia is the goal. Of half the globe. Well, I don't know if it's half the globe, but it's certainly uh, 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 the goal of a very s small but very, very powerful and very well connected group of people. And I would say, on the first part of your point, that, you know, I never imagined once upon a time that I would live in that kind of situation. I completely agree. I mean, seeing 1984 and, you know, all the all these books that we've read, We by Zavyatin, uh, um, uh, The Sleeper Awakes by H.G. Wells, all of these, all these books come true. It's been rather shattering. Yeah, Biden's speech yesterday was... I, I, was I, right I'm going to say this. I, I, I found this one of, the most uh, one of the most terrifying speeches I have ever heard from the U.S. president. I mean, I, I really, I mean, you remember a couple of and the videos ago. Exactly. A couple of videos ago, I was talking about, you know, the how with, you know, with Simon Tisdall and The Guardian already talking about the enemy within. Well, there you go. This took that a whole league, multiple leagues further. I mean, that American president, remember how when he came, became president, he was going to bring the country together? Well, there you go. That's Great the true fire. face. Yeah. Great unifier. Yeah. Um, Asiam says a question for Robert: Under which provision of the U.S. Constitution can the U.S. government decide the, leg the legitimate government of Venezuela? If not, why is it happening? I live in India, and the constitutional court here would certainly make a ruling on such an important issue. Well, I can tell you, I can answer that question, even in Robert's absence. No provision on the U.S. Constitution gives the United States government that kind of power. What it does do is it gives the president the right to conduct foreign relations. That's a different thing. It doesn't give the president of the United States, on behalf of the United States, the power to say which, which, how, how a particular country should be governed. The, the founders were completely against that kind of policy. We know that because they told us they were. <laughs> this is the thing that people always overlook. We know a lot about what the founders of the United States envisaged and how they saw their republic. They did not see their republic as going around the world, changing and overthrowing governments, recognising one party as a government and denying that another party was the legitimate government. as completely contrary both to the spirit and the letter of the United States Constitution. And if Robert was here, he would agree with me. 
Yero Gabor says, just a minute, the FBI begins making recommendations on what should be done with its information. It becomes a uh, Gestapo, J. Edgar yeah. Hoover. This reminds me of a certain affidavit. Well done. That's brilliant. We might even pass that one on to Robert, <laughs> even though, as we've seen, he, he has, <laughs> he's probably doesn't, he's not a fan of J. Edgar Hoover, with good cause, by the way. Hoover was a very sinister figure. I just remember him, by the way, um, not well, but he's at the tip of my memory. I can remember when he when he uh, uh, see, when he died and, you know, what the things people were saying about him. Mm. Alex Glanz, thank you for that super sticker. Mark Hill says we are on borrowed time. Enjoy this Christmas. Thank you, Mark mm. Hill. Uh, we will enjoy this NV Christmas. Sto- Yes, <laughs> we still have a few months before Christmas. We still have a few months. So enjoy, enjoy the months up to Christmas as well. Uh, NV Storm says, I can't help but notice the similarities between the Trump situation and the Imran Khan situation in Pakistan from the same playbook. Uh, we had a video on this. You did a video on We did on indeed. This, and this I mean, Tom actually. Longo was Tom Longo was discussing this at great length. I, I, I personally think you shouldn't take this too far in the sense that to be honest, if you want to make a comparison, it's between the United States and Pakistan, not with Pakistan to the United States. The United States is becoming more like Pakistan. Pakistan has had a deep state for as long as I can remember. And it's very powerful and very entrenched. And as I said, it's been willing to carry out coups and do all sorts of things of that kind. Um, in the United States, it's coming from the opposite direction. It's becoming more like Pakistan. It's acquired a deep state. In the 19th century, it didn't have one. In the early 20th century, it didn't have one. It does have one now. And in Pakistan, the deep state always basically disregarded law, had contempt for democracy, all those kind of things. And we see that the deep state in the United States is gradually acquiring that. So I think I think we should look at it that way round. We should see that Donald Trump's problems are resembling those of Imran Khan rather than say that Imran Khan's resemble those of Donald Trump. Mm. Lamblichus says, Alexander and Alex, I've enjoyed seeing the sights of Athens via Alex's channel. What months are best to visit Greece? When is the best weather? I want to visit Athens, Delphi, Madonna. Thanks. I actually answered this, Alexander, in the chat I wrote the answer. I said uh, May and October are very good months. I completely May, agree. May, June, October. May, May, May you have the, the flowers because the spring comes. Um, October, it's the, the sea is still warm. So if you want to swim, it's a good time to swim. But there's a freshness and a brightness. If, it, October is my favorite month, actually. Yeah, it's just not as hot. And that's it's, it's hot, hot, but not that hot. <laughs> That's exactly. the important part. Um, let's see here. Where am I? Uh, Eliana McKay says, uh, do you think diplomatic relations between Washington and Moscow will break completely? I think it's a distinct possibility. I, I think that for the moment, both governments do want to maintain relations because they still want to communicate with each other at some level. And the militaries definitely want to maintain communication with each other. The U.S. military certainly does. I mean, they've said so. Uh, it, it, almost whatever happens. But the trend is very bad, and we're closer to a total breakdown of relations in U, the US, between the U.S. and Russia than we have ever been at any time in my lifetime, including during the Cold War. And in Britain, we are many steps closer to that breakdown in diplomatic relations between Britain and Russia than we are in the United States. All right. Uh, Reckless Abandon, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Isaiah 53, thank you for that super chat. Reckless Abandon, thank you for another super chat. Chris Winans said, uh, absolutely 100%, the most important podcast on earth right now. You three gentlemen are and continue to be the most positively influential voices for truth that I and my family have ever heard. Godspeed. Thank you, Chris, for that. Uh, Tatiana, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Tatiana Carmichael, thank you for that super chat. 
Sigrid, thank you for that super chat, super sticker. And uh, Eliana says, do you think the green agenda is used as a weapon of the Great Reset to keep hegemony? Otherwise, why green agenda? Yes, there's <laughs> a short answer. I think it is. I mean, I think there are a lot of people who have uh, who are green and who are very sincere in their beliefs. I want to make that absolutely clear. And, you know, I'm not hostile to everything the greens say, not by any means. But the green movement has evolved into something very extraordinary and I think, frankly, very dangerous. And I think that it is, frankly, absolutely now part of the mechanism for achieving the Great Reset and uh, that particular agenda. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about it, actually. Uh, LB says the unified policy of Dems and Republicans is anti-Russia by definition of fallacy and contradiction. Can anyone prevail to stop the bloodshed? Can anybody prevail to stop the bloodshed? With great difficulty. But, you know, we mustn't give up. Robert has talked about populist Republicans who are now increasing in strength, who are against the war, who feel that this policy is going the wrong way. Donald Trump has spoken out about this. Um, others are doing so. So maybe, maybe there will be a pushback. I have to say, if it's going to happen, it's much more likely to happen in the United States, for the moment at least, than in Europe. In Europe, we seem to be heading towards the cliff and our leaders are pressing their foot on the accelerator. All right, Edwin, thank you for that super sticker. Barbara, thank you for that super sticker. Brian, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Buckle Brush says Bolsheviks. Thank you for that super mm. chat. Red Viking says, how much gas has the EU stored? Some reports are at 80%. Yes, 80% is about the number, but he's apparently now going to start falling because, um, you know, we're, pro we're approaching winter. They're unlikely to achieve 100%. And it's now been explained to me by various energy people, people who understand energy, who write to me, you know, they send, they send us emails. We get lots of private emails, some of which are enormously informative. But the point about those underground gas reserves, which is something which Robert Harbeck, the... German economics minister didn't understand is that they're not there to provide Germany with all the gas it needs during the winter. They're there in order to enable Gazprom, which created these reserves, to smooth out supply in case of supply difficulties. And supply difficulties happen. I mean, turbines have to be repaired. Uh, uh, um, you know, there's movements around pipelines. Um, prices change and gas has to be redirected in some particular direction. So it's useful for Gazprom to keep a certain amount of gas in reserve so that they can continue or well, it, it, so that they can continue to supply their customers that was what those reserves those underground gas reserves which gazprom created were meant for it wasn't a case of gazprom filling up the tanks you know these reserves and then switching off the taps at the end of the autumn and then providing all the gas europe needed or germany needed out of these reserves during the winter which is what uh, Harbeck appears to have thought. So you can have 100% full reserves and you still don't have anywhere near enough gas that you might need for the winter. And it shows, again, the accumulating... It provides accumulating evidence of the ignorance and the arrogance with which... European leaders, in this case Harbeck, have acted in this way. They, they've assumed that they know much more about this than they, un, than they do. And, of course, they haven't been listening to the experts. They make these decisions and they think they're cleverer than everybody else. And, of course, because they're not experts but amateurs, they make elementary mistakes which real energy professionals would never make. Right. MDE, thank you for that super chat. Reckless Abandoned says, for Robert, what is the legality of the U.S. government allowing a Ukrainian hit site on U.S. soil that has killed many journalists? I would be very interested in having Robert's answer to that question, actually. I think that is a question we can send to Robert. Um, 
I, I'd be very interested to know. My own personal view is that um, since it is clearly inciting um, illegal activity, I'm choosing my words extremely carefully because obviously I always have to think of the platform we're speaking on. But I would have thought that since it is inciting illegal activity of the most illegal kind, that it is a website that should not be allowed under US law. But I'd be interested to know what Robert thinks. Uh, Dash, Dashant's rule says, Dems, hey guys, we got him this time. No, really. <laughs> the laughy emoji. Yeah, that's Which is pretty about much it. Trump. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much yeah. it. That's about right. Uh, I mean, Tamim before Q we says, carry on with yeah. that, ju just think, though, of what this must be doing to Donald Trump as a human being and to his family to be constantly under this kind of pressure. And he's been that ever since 2015. Seven years of it. Seven years. Seven years they've been coming after this man and finding nothing. But when the moment he's cleared of one thing, they come back and they come after him for something else. Every time there's no basis to it, but they still keep coming. And I have to say, I can't think of anything more torturous than this. <laughs> Uh, Tamim Q says, I highly recommend Professor Bjorn Lomberg on climate policies, their consequences of viable solutions. He works with seven Nobel laureate, 300 oh, economists. Wow. Oh, wow. Well, OK. Thank Gosh. you for that. We'll definitely check it out. Uh, Richard Adams says, I soured on Trump when he wouldn't defend Assange. Oh, I, I understand that. And I mean, I, look, I've said this many times. Alex has said this many times. We're not unconditional Trump supporters i mean you know we are perfectly well aware of the man's many flaws and of his mistakes as president right at the very beginning i can remember when when he first became president i can remember alex saying that unless trump took steps to get on top of the social media problem he would struggle to get re-elected and that his entire program would probably run into the into the sands i can remember alex saying that and Alex repeatedly saying, as the years progressed, that Trump didn't seem to understand that. His vanity meant that because he seemed to be OK with Twitter, he didn't really give this problem the attention and the importance and the priority it needed. And he got it all wrong. And he paid the price. And so, you know, we're not unequivocal supporters of Trump. But... When he is attacked in the way that he is, in these illegal and unconstitutional ways, it is incumbent upon us who believe in law and democracy to point that out. Uh, Rob Janot says, did you say Assange? Here, have some money. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Uh, MDE says, the, D the DJT, the Trump epoch being played out, reminds me of the Psalms King David wrote of his accusers, their words will become like swords turned back into their own hearts. Absolutely. Some of the Psalms, by the way, are some of the most amazing poetry that has ever been written. And of course, they were songs uh, uh, for performance, apparently, in the temple. But um, you're absolutely right. There's a huge amount of this um, in the Psalms about, you know, uh, looking for protection from God, from one's accuses people who bear false witness against one. And people often forget that David, before he became a warrior and a king, was a, was a singer, he was a composer, he was a psalmist. Hmm. I said the Bible LB tells. says Vinman yep. LB says Vinman is a perfect example of the vengeful state within the state. Absolutely agree. Uh, Chef Nick Nero says, when they're going to redact the Constitution, oh wait, they already have been. <laughs> Very well said. Christos, thank you for that super chat. Def Lef says, how do you think this war and sanctions will end and when for the people of Europe and Britain, not politicians, but ordinary people? It will only end when people in Britain and Europe finally say enough's enough and take steps to change the political system, which is grinding them down. Now, that may happen. It's possible. I mean, it's...
protests, the, the, the European elite is talking about protests, but it will only happen after there's an enormous struggle. And that's the reality of it. The other, the other possibility is it will just continue until finally everything falls apart, which it will, and we'll have a, system, a, a systemic crisis and collapse, the systems collapse, and then, of course, we'll see, it'll be, you know, fall of Roman Empire stuff. It's not impossible. It's happened. We did a, we did a whole series of programmes on our history series about the collapse of the Russian Empire, the, the Tsar's Empire. So, you know, systems can collapse. People sh should never lose sight of this fact. Uh, RDDR says democracy is degenerating into a struggle between the petite bourgeois and the big bourgeois. <laughs> well, and then there's the super big, ultra powerful, oligarchical bourgeois. A couple of hundred individuals at most. <laughs> they seem to be they seem to be waging their own war. And for the to be truthful, they're the most dangerous of all, and they seem to be winning at the moment. In in his thoughts, says big democratic money. Big Democrat money and rhinos are now contributing to Ron DeSantis to primary against Trump. DeSantis is also yes. doing national commercials. Yes. I, I mean, this attempt to play DeSantis off against Trump has been ongoing now for months. Um, I, I, I hold on to what Robert said in an earlier program that DeSantis has ruled out standing against Trump. I know there's a lot of people who've bought into this and who'd rather that it was to Santis in 2024 as opposed to Trump. I simply say this, I, I, DeSantis I find an extremely impressive political leader. Everything suggests that he's been an outstandingly efficient and effective governor of Florida. But on foreign policy, he is completely unknown to me. And this is one of those rare moments in US history when foreign policy is the most important thing. Unless you get that right, everything else you try to do will fail if you want to change things for the better in America. Eric uh, Kalidzis, thank you for that super chat. Calberry, thank you for that super sticker. Kyle, thank you for that super sticker. Uh, Hank, thank you for that super chat. And thank you again, Hank, for another super chat. And Tom Baer says, Ben Shapiro is a warmonger. He loves it when we spill blood and treasure in the Middle East for the project. I think Bob, I think Bob would you. agree with that. <laughs> I mean, you completely agree with that. Thank you for that. Uh, Reza says, good discussion yesterday on Viva Fry, Mr. Barnes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Reza, Sparky says, ranked choice voting is the only practical way to enable a true multipolarity system in the U.S. Otherwise, it's two parties and usually ends up a unit party. I think Robert would agree with that. that. I mean, I, I'm not going to comment on this because, you know, this is a matter for American uh, uh, practice, American legal processes, uh, uh, electoral processes, I should say. Sorry, my apologies. The point is simply, I'm simply going to make is that whatever change the American people want to make to their electoral system is a matter for them. And it, but it must be done legally, constitutionally, and by consensus. The problem with all the changes that were made in 2020 is that they were not carried out legally, constitutionally, and by consensus. They were basically conjured up by one particular uh, uh, group, party, and imposed. <laughs> and, and the result was the arguments about the election that we've had ever since. But as I said, if the American people, through their elected representatives, decide that they want to introduce this system, this mechanism, in their elections. That's a matter for them. Yep. Um, Christian Katie Benoche says, you know who, who's Picasso? Barnes, Alexander, and Alex the Duran. Thank you oh, Alex is that, unquestionably. He's the person who knows all about art, especially modern art, if I may say. My taste in, <laughs> in art, by the way, is more for uh, the old masters. So <laughs> modern mm. art, I'm less good at. The old masters are good. 
Yeah. Old masters are good. Tyler Durden says, are are they maybe starting all these conflicts now because they know that Trump will probably be reelected? Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I think partly the intention is to prevent Trump being reelected by uh, uh, starting up all these conflicts and saying, well, you know, he's the he's not just the anti-war candidate. He's the person who's on who's on the other side. He's with the other side. And therefore, he's the enemy within, which brings us back to Biden's speech. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Ron Paul, if it is the real Dr. Ron Paul, uh, mm -hmm. let's let's do a live stream. <laughs> a Federal Reserve going QT will send the world into depression. As bonds roll off balance sheet, it will put upward pressure on King Dollar, which will squeeze all other currencies and countries. The fiat debt trap is too strong to escape. Well, I don't think it's too strong to escape. If the will is there, the problem is, is the will there? I don't know that it is. I, I think all the indications are that what we are seeing now are increasingly frantic attempts by the, by the powers, the people in control, the people who run the Federal Reserve, who run the Treasury, to try to keep the existing system working. And, you know, patch it up in some way, come up, you know, in, increase interest rates there, do a bit of QE there, do a bit of QT here, do this, do that, and hope that it all keeps holds together but um, um, if you really want it to change the system to carry out a proper monetary and financial reorganization you could do it I mean you know it's been done before it's not impossible but will it happen well that's an entirely different thing uh, sad ferret thank you for that super chat Ellen Olenska says, will Mark Kelly and John Fetterman refuse to debate hurt them? Is Fetterman's health fair game? I must admit, I, I, I'm not really in a position to answer this. this is I'll, I'll, I'll let, sir. I'll let, sir. Fetter, Fetterman's health is is absolutely fair game. I mean, yeah. he's not in, in – it doesn't seem like his health is, is good enough to to mm -hmm. govern. But, yeah. you know, I mean, that's – Fetterman's the guy running for uh, Pennsylvania, Alexander, and Mark oh, Kelly's for Arizona. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, but uh, Fetterman's he's had a lot of health issues, Otherwise, like uh, okay. like Robert hinted at during the live stream okay. because of of various uh, medical procedures that oh, took dear. place a couple of years ago. Oh dear. Oh <laughs> and dear. Um, say no more. Yeah, he just yeah he he he, he has a hard time, you know, f functioning. It seems. Oh dear. Oh dear. But he's ahead in the polls, supposedly, against uh, Oz, against Dr. Oz, so, oh, well. in Pennsylvania, so who knows. It goes back to the polling stuff they were talking about. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's see. Sparky says, good, bad, or indifferent, J. Edgar Hoover went partisan and was obsessed with government stability. He covered for influencers as much as he threatened them. Unlike today, his files were physically limited. Uh, the, the, the last point is absolutely true because, of course, they were paper files, <laughs> so they are by definition limited. Today's files, well, they can be infinitely, infinitely huge if they need to be because we live in a completely different age of data storage. All I'm going to say about this is I, I, I take your point. Uh, 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 Hoover was, in my opinion, one of the most sinister figures, perhaps the most sin sinister figure, in US history up to now. I think compared to what's going on today, he was almost an amateur. <laughs> I mean, his was practically a scissors and tape operation. I mean, it was done on a microscopically smaller scale than what we're seeing now. And Enra, I think, think I think he was much less embedded in the political system, the party system, than what we're seeing now, too. Enra, thank you for that super sticker. Joanna, thank you for that super sticker. Elza, thank you for that super sticker. Frank O'Reilly, thank you for that super chat. Ellen Olenska says, Biden and Deep State are dividing the U.S., demonizing opposition as undemocratic, just like CIA, NED operates, operate in countries where the U.S. wants regime change. Yeah, I think we this is all that question. Yeah. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. You, you were going to say something? 
No, I, I mean, I just, just, I'm just, I'm just agreeing with it. I mean, I, as I said, I think it's the most, one of the most sinister and frightening speeches I've ever seen an American president give. Uh, LB says uh, the short summary is who is asking, what are they asking, and how they state the question. That's with regards to polling, when someone asks a question yeah. during polling. Yeah. Well said. Uh, Sonia, thank you for that super sticker. Brian, thank you for that super sticker. Life of Brian says they're trying to set up another Whitmer-style entrapment scheme with the constant Republicans are fascist rhetoric. Mm. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. Gail Mibson. Yeah. Gail Mibson says bring Barnes more Bring, bring Barnes more often. Very interesting. Well, <laughs> He's a that. very busy man. <laughs> I mean, just, just, just bear yeah. something in mind. He's, he, I mean, I, uh, Robert, actually, I hold in awe because, of course, he has his legal practice. Anybody who has worked in a legal practice knows how demanding that is. And he, he's, he runs a superb legal practice. And, of course, he does all these high-profile cases. And don't be under any illusions. That is incredibly hard work. And then he's so generous with the time he, he gives us and so generous in the time he gives other people. I'm astonished, personally, that there are enough hours in the day for him to do all the things he does. Uh, that way to Mesfin, thank you for that super chat. Um, a different perspective says, is the U.S. paying for uranium in ruble or dollar? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, at the moment, they're paying for it in dollars. They're certainly not going to touch the ruble. I mean, they don't want to make the ruble even stronger than it already is. By the way, I just ought to say, ruble at the moment is trading at around 60 to the dollar. Now, that may seem like slightly softer than it was in June, when it was about 55 to the dollar. I think this is an illusion. I think what has happened is that the dollar has got stronger, not that the ruble has got weaker. Bear in mind that the other leading currencies, the euro and sterling and the yen, are crashing against the dollar. The ruble is holding its own. So that suggests to me that the ruble is also strengthening against all the other major currencies apart from the dollar. And that is, in, and that is interesting and, and important in itself. Rogue Thoughts says, can't wait for Biden, the great unifier, to talk about the soul of the nation tonight. Take a shot each time he calls half the nation fascist. Yeah, absolutely. Well, he definitely one, gave an interesting said. speech. Wonderfully said. <laughs> yeah. Well said, Everett says, uh, gentlemen, thank you for existing. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Pearson says, Robert, do you agree that Chinese communists have always been terminally paranoid? Seems to be that is their weakness. Well, I don't know how paranoid they are. I mean, the nature of such systems is that there's always huge insecurities and paranoia. And certainly Mao in his uh, cultural revolution times was definitely becoming increasingly paranoid. I mean, you, you only have to look at the rhetoric to see this. Whether the present lot are paranoid in that kind of way, I don't know. Raphael says, for the first time, I disagree completely with Alexander. China is not afraid to go to war with anyone. China and Russia want this war, their time. I don't know. I don't I think, think they so. want this war. I don't think they want this war. I think, I think the Chinese, if I have to say, I think a couple of years ago, they thought everything was going very well for them. They were trading to the, with the United States and they were making huge amounts of money for it. They had Taiwan basically as an economic satellite, which it was. I mean, I, I, I've actually been reading a lot about the development of Taiwan's semiconductor industry. And I gather that the Chinese, to a great extent, facilitated that because it was convenient for them in some ways. So I think that they were quite happy with this, the arrangements which existed. And then along comes Donald Trump and he makes criticisms and he starts to impose tariffs. And then there's the Huawei affair. And now we have this crisis over Taiwan. I don't think the Chinese wanted any of these things. But the point is they will respond. Uh, Raphael says when both forces are almost the same in capability, war is about size, population and territory. China, Russia and Iran together, they want to fight. I don't know that they want to fight. As I said, I think I've explained my view. I think from their point of view, they look at their respective resources and they say, well, you know, things are going our way. We don't we can we have time on our 
on our side. If, if it's a question of superpower uh, rivalry. So why go to war? <laughs> Jeff Pearson says, uh, Chinese communist paranoia and insecurity screws up all their strategic relationships, always fighting their own collective mental health issues. Yes, I mean, I, again, I, I'm a bit suspicious of this. I mean, the, the, the way that China and Russia have improved their relations, I think to a great extent refutes this. And um, I, 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 I think that also people in the West underestimate how close relations China has with many other Asian states. Uh, Nitzschwitz says, in regards to McCain, Proverbs 11.10, when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. Mm. We have lots of biblical so, uh, quotes today. Yeah. Uh, Barry uh, Cream, yes, please, says, for you, think we will see politicians uh, with Taiwan flag pins, or how about desecrating the U.S. flag with the Taiwan flag? I wouldn't be surprised. We make it may come to that. I hope it doesn't. Uh, Jeff Pearson says, "My take on Barnes. Barnes is definitely not pro-war and definitely not an imperialist. He is pro-U.S. and isn't a coward when it comes to standing up to police." I agree with all of that. I'm sure Don Robert will be would Jeff. agree with you too. Great. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, Greg UW says, you guys are wrong on central bank's role. They don't print money. The monetary issues are tied to supply uh, demographics and them, supply them and liquidity issues. Uh, banks and treasuries print, monies, print money, not CBs. Uh, please get Jeff Snyder on to discuss this. Love you all. Yeah, I, 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 I'm aware about all of this, but nonetheless, I still say QE is a form of is a form of money creation. They don't physically print the banknotes. I agree that's what the Treasury does. But the Fed has ultimate responsibility for the banking system, the health of the banking system, and be under no illusions. That is the major mechanism in, through which money is created in the United States and in every other major economy. Uh, Greg UW says, let me add that I mostly follow the Austrian School of Economics. Uh, Richard Werder would also be a great guest on CBs and QEQT, and he would have insights on Germany. Absolutely. Can I just say this? I mean, I'm not an Austrian. I'm not a person who follows the Austrian School of Economics. I think it is too perfect for the real world. But I greatly admire its rigor, and I greatly admire the some of the economists, Mises especially, who were Austrians. As I said, I may not agree with them on many things, but their critique is one that I have always valued, and that extends to the Austrians who are around today. Reza says the lawsuits were filed over three weeks ago. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Reza. Uh, Deborah says Angelo Giuliano is the best, truest view on China. Okay. Yes, Angelo is good. Absolutely. Jeff uh, Pearson says, meant to say that Barnes isn't afraid to stand up to establishment police. Found him different from Republicans, rhinos, and Democrat ideologies. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Uh, Enzo says, great stream. Guys, Patrick E. says, you three help it, help it all make sense. Thank you. I love when Robert Barnes comes on. You are all brilliant. Again, thanks. Thank you, Patrick. We love it. Uh, we love it when Robert comes. We love it when Robert Barnes comes on as well. They're real fun programs to make. Yeah. Uh, where Sage and Fool says, thank you for mentioning individual lawsuits versus class action. Isn't a swarm of individual lawsuits more effective against governments that have infringed on civil liberties rather than an easily dismissed class action by corrupt judges? Well, that is true. Of course, you mustn't discount the utility of class actions. I mean, every case has to be conducted according to its well particular character. Um, you can't make a cut and dried rule about every single case. You can't say that in every situation it's better to have it conducted in this way or to have it conducted in another way. That's where a good litigator is important because a, a litigator can look at something, say that this is, this is something that will fly, that this will work, 
this is good prospects and we're going to conduct it and this is the way we're going to conduct it and that's the kind of tactical decision that a good a lawyer who is a really good litigator can take and you you can't draw up rules if i can say and say that you know in this kind of situation that's what you do by the way in law schools, one of the worst things that I've seen over the last 30 years is that in law schools, they are trying increasingly to do that. They're trying to come up with cut and dried rules for how litigation should be conducted. Now, I don't mean, you know, the rules of procedure. I mean, you know, the kind of things that formulae, if you like, models. And, you know, they even come up with models of how court cases should be run. And I've looked at them and I just shake my head and then say, this is all wrong. And Robert isn't that kind of a lawyer. He doesn't work to a model. I can tell you that. I've never discussed this with him, but I can tell you that for certain. Uh, Jeff Pearson says, uh, pandemic planning for years. Barnes is right. Thank you for that, Jeff. Uh, we Karen, thank you for that super sticker. Uh, Zandanga says, excellent information and analysis. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Pearson says Assange and Project Veritas are legally in the same situation. The U.S. has simply denied Assange his inalienable and human rights. And Jeff also says inalienable rights in the United States were never intended to be limited to U.S. citizens. Inalienable rights were to apply regardless of citizenship. I know, crazy idea, right? No, it's not a crazy idea. It's absolutely true. Because uh, what is it the Declaration of Independence says? Independence says, how does it begin? I, I can't remember the exact words, so Americans must forgive, forgive me. But, you know, we believe that the creator, uh, you know, gifted men with human beings with certain inalienable, inalienable rights, which were life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness and various other rights ultimately see flow from that as set out in the Constitution. But the point is the creator the creator confers inalienable rights upon everyone it's not confined by citizenship of course how we enforce those rights how we protect those rights that's something that every nation and every state has to do by itself through the mechanisms of its law and constitution but if you're talking about the United States, the United States was founded on the principle that everybody, Russian, Chinese, whatever, if they find themselves in a legal case in the United States, they possess the same inalienable rights as American citizens. Zariel says, even though I have family there, I'll never return to that beloved country turned radically dystopian, saddens and frightens me to the core. I so agree with that sentiment. I mean, I don't about never return. That's the one thing I will say. But I feel very saddened by what has come about in the United States. And this speech by the President of the United States, which we've been talking about, this sinister and frightening speech, alarms me even more. Reza says, outstanding, informative commentary. It's been a pleasure listening to Robert and Alexander. Thank you. Thank you, Reza. Mark Hawkins, thank you for that super chat. Bella, thank you for that super sticker. Deborah says, bravo, the good fight. Much luck, Mr. Barnes. Uh, Jet Set One says, you are so spot on that I don't even have a question. I just want to say that I am so happy that you finally are taking up this very heavy topic. Thank you. Thank you, Jet Set One. Uh, Pauli says an emergency commission in the WHO in which five out of 15 members had strong ties to Big Pharma changed the definition of a pandemic in April 2009. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pauli, for that. And Carol Jones says amazing live stream. Thank you so much, gents. And with that, we are finished with this Q&A session with, from our live stream with Robert Barnes. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Which is a tremendous... Tremendous live stream, and we'll certainly be having more with him <laughs> eventually. Don't worry, we'll certainly be doing a lot more. Uh, 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 and as I said, hugely wonderful also to interact with all of you. Thank you for your questions.